you can turn to the Song of Solomon. I'll be continuing series there. We have been looking at this book in the way that I believe this book is intended to be seen as an allegory of the relationship that Christ has with his church. I came to uh, that, that view pretty strongly when I was in seminary and studied this in some of the Old Testament courses that I had. And it's only gotten stronger over the years, and especially now that I'm preaching from this book. This has been a book that has generally been understood from the time it was written, the days of Solomon, until about 150 years or so, uh, when many people began to assert that it was not an allegory because of higher criticism and different things like that that really aren't very solid reasons. Keep in mind that in Solomon's day, the promise that the son of promise would be David's son, that David's descendant, who would reign on his throne forever and would reign until all of his enemies were brought under his feet, had just been given. Okay? It was a fresh promise. And what happens when you have a fresh promise like that? Then there comes forth a song like this that to uh, rejoice in that relationship that has been revealed that God had shown so clearly. Sol Solomon, who obviously was not the promised son, wrote this song by the Holy Spirit about the relationship of David's greater son that would reign on the throne forever and ever and would never die, the Messiah, about his relationship with Israel, his bride, who would one day be composed of all nations. So it was a time for great joy. Some of the modern interpreters can have some helpful expositions about marriage and relationships that they get from the Song of Solomon. Of course, because their relationship with, Lord, uh, with the Lord will illustrate that. But sadly, such expositions often miss what is so beautifully and helpfully set forth in this book. And what is set forth in this book, I believe, is a message that the church, and especially Reformed churches, very much need in our day and have needed for a while. An, error where we, an area where we have deficiency. Too often we value in the Reformed churches our doctrinal precision, which is something we absolutely ought to value in a day when a lot of people don't have any doctrinal precision, don't even know what justification is or how things of that nature. But then we downplay, this is where we go wrong, we downplay the wonder and the beauty of our relationship with Christ, which we ought not to downplay. I have always tried to stress as a pastor that we are to have both sound doctrine and ardent love. The two should go together. The two are meant to complement each other, not play against one another. It seems to so often be the way that these are looked at. It is my prayer then that our series in the Song of Solomon will help us to cherish Christ more and to see more how he cherishes us. We're look, that's what we're looking for in a series like this. Our text today is very helpful in this regard. We're looking at Song of Solomon chapter 3 verses 6 through 11. What we essentially see here is the bride of Christ being brought down the aisle to him, so to speak, at, the, at a wedding. The, the procession of the bride is what we're looking at. The, there is the wonder of seeing her, of all people, as his bride. That's the first thing that we'll look at. And then after that, there is seen here the excellent way that he transports her down that aisle, as it were, from where she is to himself. And then finally, there is the delight that he has in receiving her as his wife. So just as we have seen that she is a very complex bride, as we've studied this, made up of many persons from all ages and all different places, from the dawn of history until the end of the world when she is complete and Christ returns to take her as his bride to actually bring her into his house. So here we need to see that her procession is his conveyance or his transporting of her 
to himself over, over all the centuries. In other words, this is a really long aisle, and it's for a really big bride. <laughs> um, it, this speaks of him doing what he has been doing since the fall, bringing his betrothed bride down the aisle of history to marry him at the last day, at that great wedding feast that will be at the end. So listen now as I read this text to you. Again, it is Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6 through 11. Please give full and reverent attention because this is the very word of God. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant powders? Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy and infallible word. Let me remind you that, with, that again, that poetry like this is not given to teach us what we are to believe about Christ in his saving work so much as it is, so much as other parts of the Bible are. Like if we want to learn about justification, we're going to go somewhere like Romans. We're not going to go to the Song of Solomon. But this poetry is given for a different reason. Different scripture have different purposes. This poetry is given to us that we might delight in him more and more and that we might see how much he delights in us with the result that we might love him better. That's what this poetry is for. It's not written to inform us about what we're to believe and how we're to live so much as it is to inflame and deepen our affection for him, which of course is about how we should live and what we should believe in a way. But we have come to this book with sound, we, we must come to this book with sound doctrine already intact. In other words, we're not gonna figure out about justification and such things from this book per se. We, we don't come here to learn what to believe, but to learn to love what the true faith has already taught us to believe as Christians. In preaching from this book then, I desire to set forth nothing about our faith, but what can be demonstrated from other scriptures. It would not be safe to take allegory to try to produce new doctrinal truths that we would put into a confession or a creed. Scriptures are, that are designed to teach us what to believe would be used for that more. My goal is to present the pictures given us in this song about our love for Christ and his love for us so that we will love him better and so that we will know his love for us better. So let's look at the wedding scene that is given to us here. First, the bride is presented to us. She is a wonder. Now, in our weddings, of course, the way we do things, the groom typically goes to the front of the church to wait for his bride. This isn't altogether different than the way they did their weddings. The music rises, and everyone turns to the back of the church to see her ordinarily, adorned for her husband in glorious apparel. Her procession is then from the back of the church to the groom at the front of the church. In the time of the Bible, the difference is that the procession was much larger. The brides were often brought from their father's house to the house of the groom through the streets. So rather than being just brought down an aisle from the back of the church to the front of the church, they were, they were brought through the town and uh, with the procession of attendants. Some of them would join as they made their way along through the streets, sometimes at night with lights and with incense burning and such things. In our text, the bride is described in verse 6. 
She represents the bride of Christ, the church in all ages, who is to be brought to Christ the bridegroom, that he might marry her and that he might take her into his home forever. In seeing her coming, the question is raised at the start of our text. Who is this coming out of the wilderness? There is a sense of wonder about her in the order of asking, what is she doing as his bride? There's something extraordinary that has transpired here. There is amazement because she is coming out of the wilderness to be the bride of the great king. How did this happen? Who is this? There, there, she's an unknown person. There, there, there has been an amazing transformation of her. It is loosely like the amazement that an uncle might have when he comes to a wedding and he lives out of town and he hasn't seen his niece in um, you know, quite a few years and he's there at the wedding and then he hasn't seen her yet since he's been in town and then the music rises and he turns around and he sees her and he turns to his wife and says, who is that? Because the last time he saw her, she was a little kid that was playing in the mud in the front yard and running around and stuff like that. And now she's a beautiful woman that is, is ready to, uh, to unite in marriage to this man and he, he, he's amazed. Now I say it's loosely like that because in, uh, in this case that we're looking at, the girl is not even the kind of girl that one would ever expect to marry the king and, take, and for him to take as his wife. To put bluntly, she is a girl that was in no way suited to him. Okay, One that was unattractive, again, being blunt, in every possible way. Not in character, in appearance. There was nothing in her. But now, here she is, transformed to be the wife of the great king. This is where our biblical doctrine comes in, which teaches us that we are full of sin and defilement. You see, the, the Song of Solomon just shows us the amazement of this bride that is there. How do, we, how do we take that doctrinally? Well, we know from our biblical doctrine that we are full of sin and defilement, that we're completely unfit to come to Christ because of our sin and our corruption. But we're also taught that by the saving work of Jesus Christ, we are transformed into what 2 Corinthians 5.17 calls a new creation in Christ Jesus. So that the old things are passed away and everything becomes new. There, is, there she is then, to everyone's amazement, brought out of the wilderness for him. She is like the church in the time when the Lord brought her out of Egypt. You know, Israel, when they were brought out of bondage in Egypt to be his own to be his chosen bride when she was unworthy in every way. She was just a slave in Egypt. There was nothing, nothing in her. He brought her through the wilderness and then established her as his own betrothed wife. Who is this? Who is this coming out of the wilderness to be the Lord's people? The same to be his bride. The same was done when he brought her out of exile. When she had committed harlotry and all kinds of, uh, of idolatrous, sinful actions and, and immorality. And then he delivered her over into exile. But then he brought her out through the wilderness. Brought her back. Who is she? What has happened here? And then again, when he began to gather the nations the nations that had long been alienated from God that were, were caught up in all kinds of uh, spiritual adultery and harlotry f serving their idols when they'd all known, back from Noah, they'd all known the true God and now they had gone away into all of these errors and corruptions and, and adulteries and things and now he's gathering the nations and they're coming out of the wilderness to be his people. It's remarkable. Who is this? Who, who has gathered these? Who has brought these? All of this, you see, points to the final day when the whole bride of Christ, the whole church from all ages and places will be presented to him from the wilderness of this world as a bride 
perfected by him without spot or blemish to be his own. We might say that she has been brought out of the swamp of sin, that she has been washed, that she has been forgiven, that she has been born again, that she has been transformed. And there she is, his bride, ready for her husband. Look at how she is described in verse 6. She is said to be like pillars of smoke. Now, regardless of whether this is understood in the Song of Solomon is understood in an allegorical way or not, this is a difficult thing to interpret. What is this talking about here? Pillar, she's like pillars of smoke coming out of the wilderness. How do we interpret this? Well, as God gave his people sacrifices in the Old Testament to represent the offering of Christ to make them whole, to cleanse them from their sin, it makes sense to see this as the bride of Christ with his sacrifice and intercession symbolized by the smoke of the offerings of his people, purifying and transforming her. Their sacrifices ritually purified them and transformed them in the Old Testament so that they could come and, and worship God and be his people and then, but they point us to Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God. Again, you see, our doctrine teaches us that by his death on the cross, Jesus bore our sins so that we could be completely forgiven. By his work, he not only secured our pardon, but he fulfilled all righteousness. Like burnt offerings, for example, would, would symbolize that so that we could be regarded as those ourselves who had always been dedicated to him, even though we were caught up in all kinds of fornication and spiritual adultery and such thing, that we had always been dedicated to God because we have a sacrifice, a sweet aroma that rises up to God. The smoke of his sacrifice ascends to heaven as a pleasing aroma to God, and we, his bride, are pardoned and accepted because of this sweet aroma that he has given his bride. Our record is now clean because Jesus has paid our debt, the horrible debt of sin. This is his sacrifice and his intercession that makes us acceptable to God. It's a beautiful thing. But that's not all. By his saving work, he also changes our character. Never was a sinner pardoned and justified by faith in his saving work who was not also transformed in character, born again, sanctified, so that the sinner who is thus sanctified loves him and loves his ways and wants to serve him. This work is not perfect in this life, but there is such a change in us that now we serve him wholeheartedly, and we delight in His law from within. Now we want to be His. You see, there are two, the two things that are mentioned in the covenant that God makes with His people, where He says, I will remember their sin and iniquity no more. And that, that's talking about the, the, the sacrifice of Christ that purifies us and the acceptance that we have in His righteousness is, is the one who is given as a sin offering, a burnt offering for us peace offering, bringing us to God. And then there is the, the, the second part of that covenant where God says that I will write my law in their heart and they will delight in my ways. Those go together in the covenant so that when God has justified someone, he also sanctifies them so that they love God and they turn to serve God. So this is described, the second aspect is described in our text as her perfume that she did not get from the wilderness from whence she came, but from the merchants, reminding us that the change is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Look at the rest of verse 6. She didn't already have this perfume. It says, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all the merchants' fragrant power powders. It wasn't even from Israel where these fragrant powders were, were generally taken. So clearly, she is not, this woman, is the bride, is not what she was. To everyone's amazement, she has been washed, she has been justified, she has been sanctified. 
She is beautiful to behold, having been restored by Christ. She who is a harlot is now a chaste virgin espoused to Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul said about the Gentiles who had been harlots, adulter- spiritual adulterers? He says in 2 Corinthians eleven two, 2, For I have betrothed you to one husband. Instead of running around with all these other husbands, I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul is looking forward to that day when the people that had been redeemed through his ministry would be gathered unto Christ in that great wedding day. See that, uh, him, he talks about that in, in Thessalonians, how happy he would be with that. So upon seeing her, the onlookers say, who is this coming out of the wilderness? There is the bride of Christ who was the drunkard, the adulterer, the murderer, the idolater, now transformed. Some people are shocked when they know someone that was a a drunkard or a, a hard drug junkie or whatever, and then they see them and they have been washed. They have been transformed by, by the power of the gospel so that they are not at all what they used to be. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Just look at her. Look at what God has done. So this, just isn't, this isn't just a little girl that is grown up that we're talking about here. This is someone who had been in the depths of unfitness to ever be the king's wife. And there she is, a bride now adorned for her husband. What a work of grace this is. The narrative does not stop here with this brief description of her. It goes on to show us how she is conveyed or transported to him. See then the marvelous way that Jesus transports his bride to be wed to him. Again, we need to think about how they did their weddings in the time of the Bible, when the Bible was written. The bride was brought from her father's house to the house of her groom to be wed. There was a great procession. And if she lived in another city or country, then the groom would arrange for her to be transported to him with her friends and her relations in safety and luxury, depending on how, of course, uh, how, how wealthy a man he was. This is what is happening in verses 7 through 10. She is being brought, as we would say, down the aisle to her groom, or in their tradition, through the streets to her groom, or even across trans, uh, tra- trans-provincial, coming from, from one place to another, or one country to another. He has sent his limousine, as it were, a royal and a royal entourage to escort her, to pick her up and to bring her to him. Like Joseph did when he was Lord of Egypt and he wanted his father and uh, his brothers to come to him, and he sent the carts down from Egypt in order that they could bring all of their things and come in high style to Egypt when they had been impoverished during the famine. Look at how, look at how his conveyance of her from where she is to his house then is described in these verses. First, we see that he has provided for her safety. She is described as being on a couch with trained men of valor surrounding her for her protection. Look at verse 7 and 8. Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. She is said here, to be on Solomon's couch. We have seen before that Solomon in this song is the son of David. Of course, he was the son of David. But he represents here the son of David, who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the son that was promised to David 
that would reign on his throne forever. David was promised such a son, a son who would never die and who would save his people, bringing blessing, the blessing of Abraham to them and deliverance from their enemies, that he would reign on his throne until he put all his enemies under his feet. That was a psalm that was given in the time of David and the promise of the covenant in uh, 2 Samuel 7. David named his son who followed him on the throne Solomon, which means Prince of Peace. But of course, the true Prince of Peace is Jesus Christ, David's descendant who is king forever and who came in the fullness of time when God appointed to be born of a virgin. This couch or bed, it can refer to either one. In fact, um, you can look up the, the Hebrew word that's used here and you can find that sometimes it's used for a poor man's bed, sometimes for a rich man's bed, sometimes for a poor man's couch, sometimes for a rich man's couch. It's used in all those different ways, but here a couch seems to be the best way to, to translate it. it. The couch on which the bride is seated is, is, is brought to, to him in a palanquin which we'll look at more when we get to verses 9 and 10, but it's a litter or a portable sedan that's carried along with poles and things by men carrying the poles on their shoulder. And you, you've probably seen these things in you know, movies with Romans or something coming into town and somebody important comes along and they're carried on one of these, these litters like that. This is, this is what we're looking at here. She's on the seat, the couch of Solomon. You see how the men are described here that are, are accompanying them, not the men that are carrying it so much, but the men that were surrounding them as trained military men. When a wealthy bride was transported, there would be robbers and other enemies who would want to rob her. There was a lot of treasure that was with her as she was coming to her wedding, to her husband's house, even things that she had for her clothing and that and even the palanquin itself. So consequently, a king like Solomon would provide the protection that, that his bride and, and uh, her family would need so that nothing could prevent her from coming to him. It would bring shame and sorrow to the king if something happened to her. Shame because he was not able to protect his wife and sorrow because this is Solomon who who is uh, the, the Prince of Peace, who loves his bride. These men that he has employed are valiant men. They are men, it says, who are experts with their swords. They are not mercenaries either, foreigners who might defect if things got a little heated or if they had some good financial reason to do so. These are men of Israel who have a love and an interest for their own people who love their king and want to see their nation prosper. They are well armed, each with his sword, and there are 60 of them. We're told that David had 30 men that went before him like this. Solomon has provided 60 men to go with his bride. Of course, this isn't to be some specific number here. It symbolizes the, the sufficiency of the protection. Under their protection, there is no reason to be afraid even of things in the night when attacks would often occur. What an excellent picture, this, of our Lord's provision for our safety as his bride. He will see that we make it safely from to him at his house, that we might be wed to him from where we are to where he is. Did Jesus not say in the very passage that we read from the New Testament, John 17, that he would keep all those that the Father gave to him? Did he not say that not one of them would perish except the son of perdition, that it was decreed that he would? That's what our theology teaches us. And here we see that he does this for us because of his love for us, because he wants us to come to him and be his bride. That's why he keeps us to the end. He delights to have us in his home. If you have come to Christ for salvation, be assured that nothing can prevent you from coming to him. Satan might try. He does try. Satan is a roaring lion who roams about seeking whom he may devour. He is crafty and he has no scruples about whatever devices he might use 
to try to hinder us from getting to Christ. He employs whatever he can grab hold of to, to bring about our destruction. There is also the world that opposes us. We offend them because we make them feel guilty of their sin when we're serving the Lord. They know that they ought to be and that they're not. They want to corrupt us because we expose their wickedness just by living, doing things like getting married and things like that that, that are offensive to them. Our light if what we profess and what we believe exposes the lies that they have as they try to suppress the truth, which they cannot do because the truth cannot be suppressed. They want to corrupt us because we expose their wickedness. They want to try to tempt us and lead us astray. And they will also resort to persecution to try to drive us away and discourage us from serving the Lord that if we serve Him, they're going to make us as miserable as they can. Furthermore, we are weak, and we're unable to defend or protect ourselves. Can you imagine the bride going along with no protection? She, she would be destroyed by, the, by these enemies and these robbers. But here, Jesus has surrounded us with a valiant army to protect us. None of these enemies, then, will by any means hurt us. If we are his bride, he will convey us safely to himself. In 1 Peter 1.5, we're told that we're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed from when? At the wedding day, at the last day. That's what he's bringing us to. So you see these things, we have them in our theology that are here given to us in this beautiful poetic and pictorial way. So do not be afraid. If you belong to Christ, it is your desire to be kept by him that's a desire that he's put into your heart. And you will be kept by him. If it is your desire to be kept by him, you will be kept by him. You see, an unbeliever doesn't, doesn't care whether they're kept or not. Someone who is not truly born again. But he has provided for your safety in every way. There is hope and certainty that we will arrive safely at his house at last. But it is not only for our safety that he has provided Second, he has provided for our comfort, and may we even say for our delight as his bride in this procession from where we are to where he is. We have a description of Solomon's luxurious palanquin that he has sent for us. You think about Joseph's carts again that he sent to get his, his family. Verse 9 and 10 say, Of the wood of Lebanon... Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. A palanquin. I like that word, a palanquin. It's kind of a, kind of a nice sounding word, isn't it? A palanquin, kind of a litter, as I mentioned before. It's used to transport aristocrats and royalty and such people that... Uh, or eminent people, that they, they would sit inside it on a seat, in this case, on Solomon's couch, as we saw that where she's seated, and it would be carried on the shoulders of men using poles. Some of these things were so big, I read about that they would have, uh, they have records of ones that had 18 men to carry the palanquin uh, for the, when they were going through a procession. But as you can see, there is no expense spared to make this palanquin. Each of the fine materials used is surpassed by the one that it follows in the list that's given here. Let's look at this. It is crafted of cedar of Le from Lebanon, a prized and durable wood that was used in the temple. It does not rot. It was very strong, very useful wood. But then, better than that, it had columns of silver to support the canopy. Silver is more valuable than wood. Then it moves on. Its base was made of gold. Gold is more precious than silver, of course. And then the upholstery was dyed purple, a dye that was obtained by the secretions of mollusks. 8,000 mollusks were required to get one gram of purple dye. So when you had purple dye, you had something, a clothing with purple dye in it, you had something that was more valuable even than gold. 
but the most precious of all. The interior is paved, of the palanquin was said to be paved with love. That was the best thing of all. Love is better than gold and better than purple. It is unlikely that the Lord intends for us to find some detailed allegorical connections for each of these materials. We could get rather into that. Um, one that I, I think bears mentioning that many of the fathers of the church did talk about, and I respect what they, what they uh, refer to, but that the, the purple may refer to the precious blood of Christ that was shed for us. But I don't think that's really the intent here, is that we parallel each one with some specific thing. The point here is that Christ spared no expense in providing for our redemption. As this analogy shows that Solomon used the finest things that were available to him in conveying his bride from where she was to him, so we learn that Christ used the most precious things that he had to convey us to him, even his precious blood indeed that was poured out for our salvation. By comparison, when the Apostle Peter speaks about the blood of Christ, he says, you, will, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like, like gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. His blood is so much more valuable than anything in this world. Things that we consider to be the most precious things in the world, gold and silver, purple, that sort of thing, no, the uh, blood of Christ, those things are corruptible things. The blood of Christ is something that is not corruptible. We see the strength of the love of Christ for us in that he even shed his own blood in order to provide for our forgiveness. The blood shedding was required for the forgiveness of our sins. It had to be his blood. No one else his blood would do. He who is the son of God who became flesh in order that he did this. Why? Why did he do it? Because he wanted us to be with him forever. He wanted us, he wanted to wed us and bring us into his father's house forever that we might be with him, that we might see the love that he and the father had from before the foundation of the world and that we might be brought into that love where we also engage in that love. This ought to make us very glad to be loved so well by the one who is the finest and best of all men, the very Son of God, become flesh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to be loved by Him, to be His bride, to think that He had such a great love as to provide all this even while we were yet sinners. Can we, even, can we ever doubt that he will indeed freely give us all things that he has promised. How can we ever question his love? How can we be insecure? How can we fail to have unspeakable joy that is full of glory? With such provision, his mercy and acceptance of us is sure and certain. Never, I say, never has a sinner come to him relying on his freely offered promise to obtain full remission of sins and acceptance and been rejected. Never. He would not do that because he has integrity and he has promised and it would bring shame to him to have a sinner come and that either he was unable to save them or refused to save them. He will do neither. You impugn his character if you are insecure about whether he will fulfill the promises that he has made. To suggest that such could happen, that he would not be true to his promise, is to impugn his gracious character. It is not fitting. No, dear child of God, come into his palanquin and re of redemption and grace, and he will bring you safely home safely to himself. Never has a sinner repented and turned to him and been rejected and cast out. Do not try to get to him by your own steam. You will never make it. Enjoy his provision with joy that overshadows even the deepest afflictions that the world can throw at you. You are riding in the priceless palanquin that 
your Solomon has made for you, for you, his bride, to come to him. Enjoy his love. Bask in the palanquin of Solomon, paved with love. But notice something here. It is said to be paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. I thought that that Solomon made it. Does this mean that it is their love, the love of the daughters of Jerusalem, rather than Christ's love? Is it the love of the daughters of Jerusalem that paved this palanquin and and the pavement that kind of holds it all together? No. The daughters of Jerusalem are said to pave the palanquin with love. But what love is it? It's not their love, but his love that they delight in and which they pave this palanquin within. They receive his love. They delight in his love. And as the bride of Christ, they speak to one another. They tell each other of his love. And this holds it all together. All of his saving work, the cedar, the silver, the gold, and the purple cloth, all wisely crafted, is held together by his love. The daughters of Jerusalem delight in his love, and when they do, they ride in the luxury of his grace that is more precious than any gold or silver. You see, they have, it is their reception of this love that gives the bride comfort. If she doubts this love, then she doesn't have that joy and that comfort that come. So it is paved with love. And now the focus is turned directly upon the bridegroom. In verse 11, the daughters of Zion are told to go forth and see King Solomon. Consider these daughters of Zion. Now, first of all, the daughters of Zion are the same as the daughters of Jerusalem. It's just a different word that's used there. They're interchangeable. They're the disciples, as we have seen. The daughters of Jerusalem in the Song of Solomon are the disciples of the church. Remember that this bride, again, she's a very complex bride. She has those who teach and those who are discipled. Jesus told his church to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that he commanded. When he brings, when, when those disciples are gathered and brought in, and then they're, they're taught, they're taught by the church, but they are the church as well. So the church teaches itself. The bride teaches herself. So uh, together there is this work that goes on. They are instructed here to come and see, these daughters of Jerusalem, to come and see King Solomon, who is eagerly waiting for them. What are, the, what are these daughters of Jerusalem talking You see, we saw the, who is this, looking at her. Now it's, look at him. Look at who he is. Come and look, you daughters of Jerusalem. Turn your gaze upon him. Go forth, verse 11 says, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. The focus here is obvious. They are to see this illustrious king waiting for his bride to receive her. He is, let's look at the things that are laid out for us here. He is King Solomon. Again, we've talked about that. The son of David, the prince of peace, who is the king over all of God's people and over all things. He has come from heaven to be born of David's line by a virgin mother. He is the sovereign Lord of all who saves us. And as we have seen, brings us from the wilderness to his house to be his bride. That is who this king is. He is the king who delivers us from all of our enemies and who provides redemption for our forgiveness, our righteousness, and our sanctification that we might live in his house forever in the joy of his love. We couldn't live there if the king was not this glorious king who does all of these things. He is conveying us to himself that we might wed him at the appointed day. He is the Lord of all, and he is waiting for us. We see that he is also said to be crowned by his mother. This speaks of the church's acceptance of him. His mother, interestingly, is also his bride. You can't read much of scripture and not run across that. 
The church brought him forth, but she is also his bride. Jesus said in Matthew that those who believe in him are his brother and sister and mother. He is king already, but the church, his mother, crowns him as our king by receiving him as our Lord and Master. You see, the church recognizes who he is. Uh, Many cultures, including Israel, had a tradition where a crown was put on the head of a bride and groom. And here you have then the mother, the church, coming and recognizing officially that he is our king. We know when, for example, when Jesus was here and he rose from the dead, what did the true bride of Christ do? Remember, this is about the true bride of Christ. What did she do when he was raised from the dead? She recognized him as king. He was declared to be Lord in Christ, and she, as it were, crowned him and went about proclaiming him as Lord. This is what she did. And now, here she is. You see, on the day of um, his coming, when we go to, to meet Christ, she recognizes this is the king, and she crowns him as the one who is now going to marry her in that sense. Okay, the bride again, very, very complex bride. But the focus here in this passage, where we come to the climax here, above all things, is at the end of the verse, that his wedding day is said to be the day of the gladness of his heart. He is yearning for the day when we will be presented to him as his bride without spot or blemish as those who have been transformed by his grace. He is yearning to take us into His Father's house that we might see the love that He and the Father had from before the foundation of the world. We're not there yet. He prays for that. He is yearning to bring us into His house so that we can receive that love and, most wonderful, that we can also give that love. That we can love with that love. That same love. So he can be his bride forever in his house of perfect love and righteousness. That's why I love John 17 so much because it brings forth that promise. We don't love the way we should, but we're going to be caught up into that divine love the Father and the Son have and we will be able to love in that, in that family without spot or blemish. With, we will be all that we've been called to be. This is what we have to look forward to. This is what he looks forward to even more than we do. There is something so exhilarating about about seeing such an illustrious king filled with joy at the prospect of taking us. We might go back again and say, who is this? Who is this that he wants to take? Is is his bride so, so dearly? He is the shepherd who rejoices over the sheep that was lost. Now, we're not talking about a sweet little story with a little sheep that got... We're talking about people in rebellion, people in idolatry and and, and, uh, spiritual adultery and this kind of thing. Jesus is the shepherd who finds his lost sheep, calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Jesus says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. There is no reluctance on his part to receive that lamb, that sheep. He is the one who will rejoice over his bridegroom, uh, over us as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. In Isaiah 62.5, See, we're getting the, the direct scriptures here that speak into our allegory so that we, we're not making this, the, the allegory things. They're all grounded in scripture, direct statements. Isaiah 62, 5. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you the same way that a bridegroom rejoices in his bride. He is the one who will also rejoice over us with singing. Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. What does this tell you, brothers and sisters? That if you are in Christ, you should let your heart be warmed by this portion 
of the Song of Songs that we have looked at today. You are the bride, and He is bringing you from the wilderness to His Father's house. He has already called you and betrothed you if you believe. You have been brought out of the wilderness, and you are in His palanquin. He has spared no no expense in furnishing that palanquin and providing for your safety that you might come safely and joyfully to His Father's house, joyfully in His great love that is revealed to us in that palanquin. And there He is waiting for you with joyful anticipation as verse 11 shows us. What could be of greater encouragement than this one who promises to receive all who come to Him with such gladness? It would be good enough if we could even twist his arm and beg and persuade him and get him reluctantly to receive us. But he he does much more than that. He is there with joy anticipating our coming to him with delight and enthusiasm. Words do not suffice to be able to express the, the, the wonder of what is shown us here. How could it be that he would delight in us? Please stand and, and let's, let's pray and ask Him to help us to see these things. Oh Lord, we thank You for the light that Your Word brings to us, Lord. The, the joy that, it, it brings to, that, that a poem like this brings to us. The song of songs that You have given us in Your Holy Word. Truly, this is the, the holy place in Scripture where where we see the, the relationship of Christ and His bride and the delight that He has in her and that she has in Him. We pray, O oh Lord, that You would help us to see more and more what is revealed here. Father, that we would take great delight in the love of our Savior toward us and that we would also love Him more, that we would have security and comfort in Him. Him who has provided all things that are necessary for our salvation. Lord, we could never come out of the wilderness, dig ourselves out of the swamp and and, and come to Him in safety if He had not provided for us. We thank You that the gospel is like this palanquin in which we are are protected by the gospel by the promises and by the provision of His saving work on the cross, by the Holy Spirit working in us, by the angels that He has appointed to protect us, and even the church that He has given to maintain us and preserve us, that we as the bride are able to encourage one another and to point one another to Christ as we wait and as we see the day approaching. We pray, O Lord, that you would be pleased to bless us as your people. Help us to teach these delightful things to to our children and to encourage one another to see these things and to believe these things. O Father, we need your grace every day to help us. We lose our focus. We lose sight of the precious things that are given to us in your word. And then we're so prone to to temptation and to turning aside and to becoming cold toward you. Father, may it not be so. We pray that that we would see your grace. We thank you, Lord, that overall, that even those seasons of winter and those times even when we might fall, that these times are all still within the context of your preservation of your people and that even those will not unsettle our salvation. You will bring us from there to yourself. You'll bring us down the aisle, as it were. We thank you, Lord, for the assurance and the safety we have that it is your work and not our work that gives us hope and makes us secure. Oh, Father, help us to make this message known. The nations are in the darkness. They do not know about your grace. They do not know about your love. They don't know about your provision and about the palanquin that you have made for your bride. We pray, O Lord, that we could tell them of your mercy to us. As it says in Psalm 117, that we might tell them to praise you for the mercy, for the hesed, the covenant love that you have shown toward us. That we might tell the Gentiles in darkness of this mercy, that they might come 
and praise you with us, O Lord, and receive the blessing of your salvation. Father, this salvation is freely offered to all, and we pray that we would make it known for in your glorious name. Thank you, O Lord, for the work that you have done in gathering us to yourself and in keeping us thus far, and for the hope we have that you will keep us until the end. We pray these things in Jesus' name, our risen Savior. Amen. The purpose of the benediction is to put God's name upon his people who trust in him. He just saying of taking our husband's name, we have his name upon us, and that means that he's going to do us well because his reputation is at stake. And when a blessing, sometimes we have where we bless God, and we also have where we bless God. Uh, where you receive blessing from God. And uh, this particular benediction, we have both of those. First, blessing of God and who He is, wanting Him to prosper in, in His work that He does concerning us. So looking for blessing for Him for our sake, in a sense. And then looking for Him to bring that blessing to, to us. So receive now the blessing of the Lord. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, be faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and forever. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.